So it's like the Ozone series, where the title is The Ode. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to our closing session. Uh, it's a pity it's the last session, uh, but we've accomplished quite a lot, I suppose. Uh, I begin with a couple of announcements uh, that Linda asked me to pass on to you. First of all, the recording of this closing session, as well as the other two uh, plenary, right, plenaries, uh, will be available online on the webpage of the School of Communication. So you can uh, college. Co college of Fine Arts, okay? So you can share it, uh, you can look at it again, uh, you can watch it over and over again. Okay, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is about your PowerPoint presentations uh, that you used in your lectures. Uh, if you are ready to share them with the other participants, uh, please send them to. Oh, there will be a button to click on the web page of the conference to submit them. Okay, also let me remind you of the process of submitting your papers for publication. There is a button to click and to send, uh, it'll be uh, well reviewed, obviously, and then edited properly to be published uh, by uh, East Carolina Library in cooperation with the University of North Carolina, which, uh, at least in Poland, is in the top 20 publishers in the world. That's yes. Strategically important information. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the thing that we planned to close, uh, and I, you know, we, we thought of it several months ago, uh, and now after this conference, I know that Marcin Drona was the right choice as the closing Oops. speaker. <laughs> uh, because he, as a journalist, will probably, even though he hasn't heard the lectures, somehow relate to most of what was said about the media, journalists, journalism, uh, uh, internet media, mainstream television, uh, because he's been, not everywhere, but he's done a lot in the media. Uh, he was my student uh, <laughs> a few years ago. Never graduated. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I thought of inviting him here, remembering that Washington is not far from, from Greenville, but also because Marcin's history is the history of free media in Poland. As a student in 1988-89, remember? Right? That's the moment when things are beginning to change in Central Europe. Uh, as a student, uh, he started skipping classes. Why? Because he was uh, one of the first reporters for the very first free private radio station in Poland, RMFFF. The name was slightly different back then, I think, reversed, but anyway. Uh, it was something that everybody listened to in Canada. And they were not political at the beginning. It was music, it was some commentary, and it was reporting about things in the city. I'll never forget the first ever live report I heard on the radio. Communist radio did not report live, of course, it was too dangerous, wasn't it? Yeah. Reporters might say something that uh, would not carry well with the, the censors. So, uh, it, it, I'm, sure, I'm sure you remember that. The burning of the Krakow Philharmonic. Of course. He was there, uh, two days in a row, reporting on what was burned, what was not burned, how many firemen uh, <laughs> that came, right? The beginnings, the very beginnings of Polish free speaking. Uh, that was the first, the first memory I had with you. Then, Maggie Thatcher coming to Krakow, right? And there he comes into the main hall of the Jagiellonian University, where she had her lecture, and time for questions. And he asked the type of question that never ever would have been asked before the free media appeared. I don't recall exactly what you asked about, but it was a very uneasy question. Uneasy question, and the people around went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right, and then maybe something academic. Uh, this was when he was about to finish his studies, and he comes to me and says, I've got, I've, I've, I'd like to do an interview with you. I said, sure, no problem. Uh, 
and he started asking the kind of questions that never had been asked to an academic in Poland before, probably. So tell me, an nepotism in the promotion of professors at your university? Do you feel that your ambitions can be realized here? Is there any peer pressure or your boss pressure on you? Too much of it, right? Open questions about things that now we discuss and talk about, right? This is the talk of the town. This is the talk of the media, too. That was the very beginning of a completely new vision of the media. That's what I thought. He is the guy to talk about what, maybe not so much the history, but about the last few years um, in Poland, but not only, because he, for many of us, most of the Polish colleagues here, he is the voice of Washington, D.C. Uh, he is currently, he's been for like, what, 16 years? 16 years. Uh, the correspondent, Washington correspondent for TVN and TVN24, which are the largest uh, TV stations in Poland, well, it is a TV station in Poland, uh, owned by Discovery, the American firm, now Warner, right, after the merger. And Marcin is, well, the, the chief correspondent for TVN from Washington, uh, a guy with a lot of experience in journalism, because before that, he was an investigation journalist or investigative journalist for TVN, um, dealing with the mafia on a couple of occasions, if I remember well, uh, live shows again, right, with, with uh, witnesses and all that. And the story went, this is probably untrue, that he had to leave Poland uh, because the mafia was after him. <laughs> well, the mafia was after me, but that was not the reason. <laughs> Okay, but this is not my show. This is his live report from Washington, D.C., and this time, Greenville, North Carolina. Marcin, uh, the state of the world. Well, thank you very much. And uh, he brought some fine uh, memories. Uh, the, the, the fire of the uh, uh, Symphony Hall in Krakow. Uh, I'm reporting live. I see a fireman going down from the roof. So I'm talking live, and in my stupid head, I had an idea of coming to the fireman and asking him the very basic question, what's this situation up there? And so I did that, and he turns to me, we're alive. He turns to me and he says, pretty fucked up. And, <laughs> and, uh, and now do something with that. Uh, that, uh, that wasn't easy, but I will never ever forget that. Um, uh, uh, Wadek is quite right that uh, and, uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to start my career uh, just five weeks after the uh, first uh, uh, semi-free elections in Poland of June uh, 1989. Uh, I uh, started at a local radio station in Krakow. Uh, on July 11th of 1989, and it was still the communist times. Even when we were preparing a short story about the prices of veggies at the, at the markets in Krakow, I had to call the censorship office and tell the censor what my story was about. And he would give me a number. I, I had to put this number on my story, on, on the sheet of paper. And only after that, it could go on air. So I, I remember those times. And I was, again, you know, I, uh, uh, it looks like I was, I was you know, born with a, with a silver spoon, you know, because uh, uh, a few months later, I was asked to join uh, eight people who had this crazy idea of opening, building the first free independent commercial radio station in uh, the history of uh, free democratic Poland. So, so we did that. We we built what today is the largest commercial uh, radio network in Europe. Uh, I was again stupid to leave too early because uh, before I could, you know, uh, cash in. <laughs> so I I uh, I moved from radio to TV in 1997, uh, which again was something new because in October of 1997, TVN was launched as uh, the second commercial TV network in Poland. But the first one 
which wanted to follow uh, the evening newscasts of the United States, Great Britain, you know, uh, uh, remember, still early 90s or mid 90s, rather. So, so there were uh, still some good examples to follow. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, so I was asked to join this, this, this crew that was working on, on the very first uh, 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 newscast at TVN. And it was yet, yet a new, new, new adventure. In the meantime, uh, I, I also covered uh, the president's administrations, uh, Lech Valenza and then uh, Alexander Kwasniewski, which uh, was a totally different experience. I can talk for hours about Lech Valenza and uh, the problems that translators had with him. <laughs> I will never, ever forget Lech Valenza talking to the um, uh, Foreign Relations Committee of Bundestag. Uh, Bonn was still the, uh, the capital of Germany at that time. And Lech Wałęsa had a few glasses of beer uh, or, or, or wine. Uh, and uh, what he was saying was a bit awkward. And at some point I turned around and there was this booth for, uh, for, for the guy who was interpreting Lech Wałęsa. His jacket was off, his tie was down to here, his uh, 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 shirt was unbuttoned and there were streams of sweat going down <laughs> his cheeks. Uh, because uh, because uh, uh, interpreting what Le Valenza is saying is not an easy thing to do. Uh, so uh, in 1998, I started my talk show that 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 Wadek talked about. And yes, it's true. Uh, there were a few uh, attempts on my life, uh, uh, but I'm still here. I'm still with you. And in 2006, I moved to to Washington. You know, it was it was my kind of professional dream to be a correspondent in Washington, D.C. I was for the first time here. Uh, by here, I'm in the United States in 1991 on a scholarship organized by Rutgers University uh, and uh, one of the uh, journalism associations in Poland. And, and I knew the moment we got to Washington, D.C., I knew that that was the place where I wanted to work one day. It took me a few years. I, I, I finally started, you know, uh, in 2006. I came here for a two-year contract. It's uh, 2022. I'm still here. So looks like it <laughs> looks like I'm uh, I'm gonna stay here. Okay. Uh, let me talk about uh, let me talk about because Linda wanted wanted uh, uh, me to talk about Ukraine, about the war, about how the war is covered, but. Uh, before we can talk about this, we need to look at the media landscape in Russia. What Vladimir Putin did, uh, one of the first things he did when he took uh, control of Russia was uh, slowly but surely killing free independent media. So independent TV stations, independent radio stations were either uh, you know, uh, getting out of market, or uh, the state uh, institutions were taking control of them. Putin knew that once you control free media, or rather, no, let me rephrase it, let me rephrase it, uh, when you take control of media, when there is no more, uh, uh, you know, free, free media, you can control people's minds. And uh, so that's, that's what Putin did, uh, on his way uh, to realize his crazy, ambitious dream of reconstructing the Russian uh, Empire. Uh, what is left now are the propaganda outlets. What is left now are a few online outlets that, uh, you know, they are, they are small, they have limited uh, uh, audience. So, in fact, they do not really reach Russians. And uh, there was one more thing that Putin did right after he started the invasion. A new law was passed. Uh, a law which can, uh, which forbids basically telling the truth. If you are not following, in your report, if you are not following the state propaganda, the official line of Kremlin, 
you can be sent to a labor camp for 15 years. What is the result of this law? What do you think, guys? What, what did this cause? Let's, let's do a bit of Q&A. What do you think happened? Si yes. Two things. First of all, uh, Russian journalists, if there were any independent journalists left, they were silenced. But another thing happened. Almost all of the foreign correspondents left right. Russia. And what does it mean? It means that even if Russians have access to BBC, CNN, what not? They do not know what the real state of affairs in Moscow is because all of the correspondents left. That's what TVN did. TVN uh, had uh, 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 a wonderful correspondent. Uh, he lived in Russia for some 20 years, a guy from Krakow. Uh, so, you know, of course, wonderful. Uh, and uh, and uh, he, uh, he was covering the conflict from Moscow. Uh, and uh, the moment the law was passed, our bosses said, hey, we need to relocate him. We cannot risk uh that uh, that that he uh, that he's arrested and he's sent to a labor camp for 15 years uh now uh, you can uh you can say what about access to internet well china shows us that you can limit this right uh you can block access to certain sites uh so and of course russians are doing that Russians are the Russian, uh, the state uh, 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 agencies are, are controlling them. Let me give you two examples, and they are very telling uh, about what the state of mind of educated Russians is because of all of those steps that Putin took on his way to an attempt to reconstruct the uh, the Russian Empire. I have a wonderful friend, uh, he lives in Virginia, a, a, a retired doctor who travels uh, 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 the world, and uh, and a few years ago, he went to, to Russia, St. Petersburg, and other uh, places. Uh, he hired a local guide, a, a young, well-educated uh, uh, woman. And after the war started, he emailed her saying how sorry he is uh, for what she has to be going through, being an educated woman, seeing where the truth is. She replied that she feels sorry for him because he is brainwashed, because he believes Western propaganda. A young, highly educated uh, uh, person who speaks fluent English. And another example, uh, one of, uh, uh, of Polish intellectuals traveled to Moscow many times, has many friends among Russian intellectuals. And uh, she posted an article recently saying, I, I'm giving up. I'm trying to talk to them. I'm trying to reason with them. They do not believe a word I'm saying. They believe Putin. So, uh, Putin took all of those steps in order to have an information desert where only his propaganda is left. Now, let me go back to, to internet. Um, I will try to use this stand because now I need to open my laptop. Okay. So I'll be doing two things at the same time, and I hope I, I can cope with that. Uh, because I want to show you something. And um, uh, uh, let me make a short introduction first. It was almost a year ago. I believe it was June or July of last year. Uh, you may remember massive protests in Cuba. Uh, and uh, there were also, okay, 
there were also massive protests uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, 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 the location was Lafayette Park. Uh, this is right in front of the, of the uh, White House. Uh, uh, by the way, if you ever go to Lafayette Park, there is a uh, Tadeusz Kościuszko statue there, uh, who is a, a Polish and American hero, one of those who helped you, helped you gain independence. Uh, so, so if you're there, uh, you know, look, look for the statue. Uh, so anyways, uh, we went there to cover uh, the protest, uh, but that was also the day when Poland, with American allies, signed a uh, document which was uh, 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 sponsored by uh, Secretary Anthony Blinken uh, condemning uh, Cuban regime and advocating for free speech, free press, freedom, etc., etc. So we're getting ready to go live, and suddenly, and suddenly, uh, this is this is what happens. It lasts for two minutes. <laughs> So suddenly the crowd attacks us. Uh, till this day, I don't know why. Uh, till this day, I don't know why. And uh, uh, some of the people were saying that uh, the crowd thought we were uh, uh, sent by a Cuban embassy, that we are supporters of the regime. Uh, some people were saying that probably they mistook me for uh, someone who is anti-freedom or whatever. Anyways, we got attacked. Uh, thanks to Washington, D.C. police, we were driven in a police cruiser to safety. We were followed by a few cars with angry Cubans who were, maybe you heard this, uh, they were calling us assassino, uh, assassins. Uh, they were uh, 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 yelling fuera, fuera, you know, get out. Uh, and uh, so anyways, James Cook posted this, Cuban demonstrators outside the White House have chased out the reporter, true. This happened. Jack Possibles, he has almost 2 million followers on Twitter. He writes, Lib for liberal reporters are not welcome. They support the regime. Total BS. 
I've been to Cuba. I reported on the situation in Cuba. I talked to Cuban opposition. I was born and raised in a communist country. We know what communism is. But this person, and this is how you spin the truth. This is what you can do in social media or with social media. This is what can happen when uh, people believe only what they see uh, on websites, social media, basically when internet is the main source of news. People believe this guy. They believe this guy that I'm a supporter of the regime. That's not the end of it. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one. I'm not really good with presentations, so forgive me my clumsiness here. Uh, okay. Do you see this? I hope you do. Uh, let's, let's look at the comments. This is absolutely beautiful. Okay, so this person believes that Cubans chased an enemy of uh, Cuban freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. It has nothing to do with the facts. It has nothing to do with what really happened there. Zero. Let's go to the next one. I'm still getting quite emotional when I'm, when I'm talking about that because you, you may have seen droplets of water on the, on the camera lens. People were spraying us with water. They were throwing bottles at us. They were pushing us. Uh, okay, someone checked his pants. Ha ha ha, very funny. Uh, love it. Fake news anyway. Doesn't matter who this guy is. He's definitely fake news. Uh, who is he and what network? Finally, someone asked a question, and the answer, well, not really true. TVN is, is not owned by Disney. It's, it's discovered. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, why am I showing you all of this? Let's, let's go to the last one. Uh, Greeting brothers Cubans down with communism and their media. It's a Polish guy. He's a Polish politician from north uh, uh, western Poland, member of the current ruling party. Uh, when you spread lies, this is your faith? I don't quite understand this. But, anyways, so as you see, it is enough to have one person who twists reality, who starts spreading uh, lies. But when this person is trusted or followed by many, then this is what happens. Uh, on Instagram, it was even worse than that. That's, that's, uh, that's one of the, of the uh, uh, examples I wanted to show you. And uh, what it reminded me about yet another one. This time it's 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 a funny one. <laughs> yeah. So I went, I was invited to the White House Correspondents Dinner a few weeks ago. And as uh, Discovery is you know merged with Warner Brothers, Warner Bros. Uh, we are you know uh, basically in the same family as CNN. So I was invited to sit at one of the CNN tables. And I really liked this. You know? So I took a photo. And all I said was, Valek, uh, 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 how do I translate that's this? It. So that's it. Basically, it's all it says. So that's it. Three uh, 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 dots. And this tweet was seen by 267,000 people. Uh, why? Because this is one of the articles. Martin Grona disappeared from facts. Facts uh, is uh, our nightly newscast on TVN. And uh, he was bragging, or he bragged, uh, 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 showing a photo. Uh, uh, congratulations are. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I never graduated. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, this is just one example of articles about me 
uh, leaving TVN for CNN. <laughs> this is yet another one. Uh, Martin Verona is leaving TVN after 25 years. Now, I will ask you a question. It's a very simple one. How many of the reporters who wrote those stories contacted me before writing those stories? No. Two days after those stories were published, one reporter called me and he said, hey, uh, is this true? I said, no. <laughs> And so now we have two problems on our hands. One problem, uh, I'm saying don't trust the internet. But who do you trust then when my colleagues, journalists, are writing stories which uh, have absolutely no basis in truth? They don't even bother to send an email, text message, make a phone call to check what the truth, truth is. This is a huge freaking problem because, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, we, we are complaining, by we I mean journalists, we are complaining that uh, our audiences sometimes do not really trust us. And then we are the ones who are to blame. Uh, thanks goodness, uh, you know, I, I've been with uh, TVN for 25 years, and I hope to be for, you know, quite some more time, you know, with, uh, with TVN. I'm not leaving for CNN. CNN would not want me, probably, to have me among, uh, you know, their journalists, but I'm really happy with where I am and what I'm doing. So, uh, uh, so anyways, you know, I am blessed to be working uh, uh, at a news organization, which checks and double checks. When I'm writing a story, uh, when I'm writing a script for a package or a story, which is supposed to uh, you know, appear on the nightly newscast, I write my script, I send it to the foreign desk. Then my colleagues at the foreign desk read it. And if there is anything they don't like, they call me and they ask questions like, are you sure about this fact? Are you sure this is the correct conclusion? When we, you know, both sides kind of agree that, that everything is accurate, then the script, before I produce this story, the script goes to the main editor of the day and he reads it again. And if he has any, you know, doubts, he has questions, then he is checking everything with us. And uh, so check and double check and triple check. This is the only way to, uh, to deserve, mm, to be trusted by, by the audience. Uh, you need to make sure that all of the facts that you present are true. Now, Ukraine. Okay, so <laughs> kind of drifted away. Uh, so, how does TDN cover the war in Ukraine, and uh, what is what is our position on independent media? I kind of you know talked about this a moment ago, but let's let's look at at, at Ukraine. Um, there are three aspects that we cover when it comes to to the war. We cover the war itself, which is obvious. So we have our crews in Lviv, Kyiv. Uh, we also have a wonderful uh, uh, freelancer who is in Kharkiv. Uh, and we are uh, uh, you know, uh, presenting actual uh, factual uh, uh, knowledge from coming from those places. Uh, it was our correspondent who was the first one to uh, uh, to reach uh, 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 the guy who was two days ago on CNN, a few days after our correspondent found him, uh, who was shot in his face, buried alive by Russians, and uh, uh, so so our our guy was the one who found him, uh, an amazing correspondent. 
So we are uh, providing our audience with uh, uh, facts uh, from, uh, from the war theater. That's one. Two, we have a humanitarian crisis in our hands. Over three million Ukrainians uh, came to Poland seeking refuge. So we are, of course, covering uh, that aspect of the war, the humanitarian aspect of the war, but also we're doing yet another thing, which is uh, one of the foundations of this job. We are checking and double-checking what the authorities are doing to help those people. Are they ready for the next phase? Are they, are they ready uh, for even a bigger influx of, of, of refugees? This is our job, to ask tough questions. And the authorities, uh, not only in Poland, in any given country, do not lie when they are asked tough, tough questions. And, and I will, I will you know, uh, also talk about the relationship that we have with the current government in Poland. And uh, the third aspect is uh, checking if the authorities are prepared for a potential escalation of the conflict. Where are we when it comes to our military? Where are we when it comes uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, getting people ready for a possible, whatever, uh, a missile or drone that, that, that hits home? Anything can happen because Russians are uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, shelling uh, uh, towns and locations which are more or less ten miles from the Polish border. So you know, ten miles for a for a missile is like nothing. Uh, so anything can happen. So these are the three things, three things that uh, that 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 we are concentrating. Now, when you are looking at the hands of the authorities of the government. Uh, the governments do not like that. Again, plural, because it's not only in Poland, it's everywhere. Uh, the government in Poland really doesn't seem to like us. Uh, and uh, they tried to silence us. They've been trying to silence us for a few years. They tried to pass a new tax law they uh, tried to cut uh, the, uh, uh, the revenue from, from commercials on TVN. Uh, and finally, their kind of last idea was to pass a law, which, you know, when you look at it without having a context, you might even say, hey, it makes maybe some sense. Uh, their official line was, we want to prevent our media market from Russian and Chinese influence. So that's why we want to pass a law that would allow only uh, foreign ownership of media in Poland when the owners are from European Union. So how many outlets in Poland are owned by entities from outside European Union? It's us, owned by an American company. Just one, only us. And uh, it was obvious that, uh, you know, Russia, China, what, really? Uh, they, they wanted to find a way to silence us. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the American politicians, the political class in Washington really uh, didn't like this idea. So there were statements coming from the State Department. There were statements from uh, the uh, Department of Commerce, uh, from uh, the House of Representatives, from the Senate, etc., etc., etc. And uh, and uh, 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 the president of Poland, Sigmund that he would veto this law. And when, despite all of the warnings, all of the requests, uh, the uh, majority uh, uh, at the parliament, uh, the parliamentary, uh, uh, parliamentary uh, majority passed the law, the president decided to veto. 
Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I guess, I guess it was a lesson uh, in a way also for the authorities in home. Yeah. Ownership, be it media ownership or any other ownership, is sacred. It's one. Free media uh, and freedom of speech is also sacred. So just leave those things alone because uh, uh, any meddling with them uh, is really not helpful, especially for our image abroad. Um, and um, oh, uh, and the last thing I wanted to share with you is uh, my huge, huge admiration for all of my colleagues who are covering this war. Uh, I, uh, I covered one war. It was the Kosovo War uh, in late 90s. Uh, my cameraman and myself were arrested by Serbian military. There was an order to execute us. We were kept at gunpoint for 12 hours. And uh, after that experience, I said, wars are not for me. I'm done with covering wars. But there are uh, uh, colleagues of mine who, uh, who have a strange, I don't know how to call this even, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they just love this. Yeah, so, but I'm not one of them. Uh -uh. I, 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 you know, I, I prefer being here. Uh, but I don't know if, uh, if that covers at all what you wanted me to say. Uh, and, and I'm open to questions, guys. If you, if you have any. Thank you, Martin. You covered a lot. You certainly covered a lot, uh, both in terms of the themes and topics of this conference, as well as outlining some of the political debates that we've had around free media in Poland. Thank you. Uh, I am sure there will be questions or comments. Uh, you are welcome to ask them. Laura, I'll give you the mic. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think is, where do you see things going in the Russian-Ukraine conflict? Um. It's What's our a, future? What's the next six months? It's six not to even months. a million dollar question. It's a trillion dollar question. Uh, yeah. And uh, and no one, no one knows the answer. Putin, uh, and, and we hear this more and more often, and our network also covered this uh, already a few weeks ago. Putin is probably sick. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to a few doctors. I read a few uh, pieces published by doctors, that the way he behaves, the way his face is puffed, kind of, uh, it suggests steroids, and yeah, yeah. So so he may really be very sick, and the, and the uh, one of the uh, bosses of Ukrainian intelligence said that he has blood cancer. Uh, well, we didn't know that. But anyways, when you have nothing to lose, you're unpredictable. And this is what, what, what worries me. Uh, because, exactly. So I already heard you know, a few scenarios from people who know what they are talking about, okay? about maybe a possibility of a tactical war that being used. Not, not, in, 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 uh, uh, not to bomb a city, town, military base, or whatever. No, just you know, uh, exploded over uh, the Black Sea, uh, so that no one uh, uh, is hurt. But you're showing that this is what you can do, okay? This is like the next step of the escalation. Um, it's probably not, not uh, nothing, nothing new what I'm going to say now. Uh, the West did not listen to what is the eastern flank of NATO. Poland, the Baltic states, we have been warning the West for many, many years about Putin. Putin tested the West with invasion of Georgia. It was 2008, dates are very important. It was the summer of 2008, 
2008 was the election year in the United States. Uh, and Putin wanted to see what the reaction of John McCain would be and the reaction of Barack Obama. John McCain condemned it uh, immediately. Barack Obama didn't do that. Uh, so, you know, at that time, you know, uh, Putin was still calculating, test checking, you know. Then there was 2014. Who was the president? Barack Obama. The one who didn't immediately condemn the invasion of Georgia. So in 2014, there was not much of a Western response. Yes, there were some changes, but uh, limited. So Putin was encouraged to kind of expand his um, horizon, let's put it this way. And you might remember that in July or August of last year, Putin published an 18-page long essay on Ukraine. It's really an interesting uh, thing to read because in that essay, Putin claims that Ukraine was never a country. There's never, never been such a country. Uh, of course, he twists facts. He twists everything, you know, and uh, uh, that's, that's Putin. So he was already then preparing, uh, you know, his current uh, 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 engagement in, in Ukraine. And in the meantime, there was Nord Stream 2. Don't forget about that. Exactly a year ago, uh, President Biden lifted sanctions on Nord Stream 2, which again encouraged uh, Putin. Why am I, uh, uh, you know, talking about all, all of this? Putin thought that the West is weak, that there is no unity in the West. And uh, the West surprised him. That there is unity. Uh, there is a decisive action, but it's a bit too late. Uh, the, the types of armaments that are being sent to Ukraine, very useful, a few weeks too late. Mm -hmm. That's why in Donbass, the Russians are advancing. That's why Mariupol uh, could not be defended by Ukraine. So uh, I think that what Putin wants to do now is to take control of Donbass, and the moment he has control of Donbass, he may be ready to negotiate something. Or there was also another theory uh, 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 discussed recently that Putin would like to kind of uh, circle uh, uh, with uh, Ukraine with his troops going from Donbass all the way south, Mariupol, Odessa, and then. Uh, the sliver of breakaway Moldovan uh, 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 territory, which is called uh, Trans Transnistria, Transnistria uh, and uh, uh, which is Russian control. So, so if he if he manages to do this, he cuts Ukraine away from access to the Black Sea, and uh, and then you have Belarus in the north which is Russia controlled or Russian controlled. And then you have the control of Donbass all the way down uh, along the, the, the Black Sea and a bit you know, up on the, on the Western part with uh, Transnistria. But what, what happens? Well, no one knows. What do you have? I said, what if he dies? He's sick. Uh, what if he dies? Uh, that's a wonderful question. That's a $2 trillion question. <laughs> um, there is an, an opinion piece on, uh, on our website uh, saying that this is probably the last year of uh, Putin staying in power. Uh, you know, uh, uh, autocrats, in order to stay in power, they create a circle of trusted people around them and they get rid of everyone who could at some point uh, pose a threat to them. So Putin did that. 
uh, there was, uh, uh, before the invasion started, there was a uh, cabinet meeting with, uh, and it was televised, with all of his ministers, heads of security services, etc., etc. And uh, there is a clip, you may find it online, online. Uh, so anyways, but, but, but this is true, it, it did happen. So uh, the head of one of his security services comes to the microphone and he says, uh, President Putin, we do support everything that you asked for. And Putin, you know, smirking says, so what do you su uh, support? What is it that you're for? And, and this guy says, I support uh, 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 Lugansk and, and, and Donetsk uh, republics becoming a part of Russia. And Putin says, this is not what we're talking about today. So what do you support? I support, uh, we are talking, says Putin, about uh, uh, giving them support. Are you for it? Yes, I'm for it. So you see that basically uh, uh, even the closest people to him have no freaking idea what's going on. And they say whatever he tells them to say. If he dies, there, there, may, be, uh, uh, they, there may be a huge problem for his inner circle and for the rest of the world. Because they, they, there may be some inner fight. Yes. Yes. Who is supposed to take over? Uh, is, you know, there's always this question. Is the person taking over going to be worse than the dictator that we are dealing with now? Uh, it, is, it is a huge problem. Yes. Thank you. You're... Professional biography, as, as it was described, was one of, kind of state-controlled media being relinquished and the beginning of kind of free press. But your description of Russia was kind of the opposite, the way Putin slowly created the state-controlled media. What do you think could be done now um, to start creating the possibility of a Marcin Lorona in Russia? Um, <laughs> so yes, his podcast in a few years or something. Well, uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, with, uh, the biggest problem with Russia now is that, I don't know if, if the polls are, you know, even close to being accurate, but they are saying that 84, if I remember correctly, percent of, 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 of Russians support the war and support Putin. Uh, that's the whole problem, yeah. you know. Those... Those people are so brainwashed. They were uh, being fed a constant, uh, you know, uh, propaganda pie for for what, 22 years now. That uh, I don't think they even want free media. That's that's the whole problem. You know? uh, a a a recent, uh, you know, and, and and it's kind of funny because I read. I guess last night, uh, articles on uh, British and American papers uh, about a retired colonel who was on state TV in Russia, who said that uh, the advancements are not going too well. And everybody is questioning, what happened? Why did this guy say that? Why did someone decide to say the truth on state-controlled Russian TV? You know, uh, maybe it's it's you know an elaborate scheme, you know, uh, to uh, to prepare people for what's coming, or maybe this guy suddenly you know went rogue. We don't know that. Uh, I am afraid that people in Russia are not uh, are not uh, ready for for now for for free independent media. You know, uh, when 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 we were growing up in Poland. Uh, you know, we were listening to uh, uh, BBC Polish service. We were listening to Radio Free Europe. We were listening to Voice of America. Or uh, there, uh, there were, you know, those underground uh, uh, radio shows recorded on cassettes. And, you know, and 
you had to bring a, 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 a new cassette, you know, uh, uh, an empty kind of cassette, uh, uh, so that you could join an underground audio library. And then you would, you know, get those, you know. So anyways, we in Poland were kind of hungry, despite we didn't have internet, computers, whatever, because it was 1980s. We were hungry for, you know, a, a, a true news, independent news. I do not think that uh, think that Russians are. How about Stereo? One of the things you talked about um, was the availability of, I'm going to say information on the internet, but not necessarily accurate information. And I, I feel I've seen a, a huge decline in the U.S. of the um, even attempt at objectivity or neutrality on the part of our of, of most journalists and most journalism outlets. So, um, how do we, as media consumers and as educators of media consumers, plow through all of the stuff that's out hmm. there to find a, a, a modicum of quote unquote truth? I hear you. Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you. I'm watching Fox and CNN, <laughs> and uh, and that's it. You know, uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, reading Washington Post, New York Times, but I'm also checking what uh, Wall Street Journal is uh, you know, is writing about. We live in very difficult times uh, that are very polarized, and look at the political landscape. Both parties are being taken over by, I don't want to say extreme elements, but, you know, elements that kind of go way more to the right or to the left. And, uh, and, 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 and what happened with the, you know, centrists? They're gone. Um, I guess I told you guys that when we went to uh, Ben's Chili Bowl, which is a very nice place in Washington, D.C., if you ever are in D.C., Ben's Chili Bowl, a nice, nice hot dog place. It was their first experience uh, of that type. So um, now I lost the train of uh, of, uh, of my thoughts. Shoot. <laughs> okay, I forgot. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Thank you. Oh, someone is listening. Hey. <laughs> so I was I was at an event in D.C. and um, it was a uh, Freedom House gala uh, two weeks ago. And uh, there was a person who introduced herself as a, uh, a member of something, something Republican. And she immediately added, but I'm a John McCain Republican. Uh, because, you know, when you say Republican, especially that, but, but uh, it also happens with, with Democrats. You know, lots of my uh, friends who are Democrats and, and, and they've been my friends for well over a decade. They are going more and more and more to the left, you know, and, uh, and there is nothing in the middle left. Uh, uh, and, and that is the problem. And that's what also, you know, happens in case of some media outlets. Not much we can do about this. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask you two questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to come back to what you said about some or most intellectuals in Russia who you say uh, get back to their colleagues in Europe and say, well, we feel, we feel uh, or we take pity on you because you don't actually know what things are like. Putin is right and we know it. I somehow find it hard to believe that intellectuals who are people, you know, speaking foreign languages, who I'm sure have traveled worldwide, have suddenly changed up to a point at which they simply refuse to accept um, something that is downright truth. And I'm wondering about this. Isn't it that they say to the European colleagues, you don't know what things are like because they're afraid to say what's really on their mind. And they know that they are being 
uh, well, you know, spied on, yeah. so to speak, and they won't, they won't simply speak their minds out because they know the consequences may be so serious. It is a possibility, of course, but uh, 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 look at how many people lose Russia since uh, first detentions and then the war began. And it is intellectuals uh, who are leaving Russia, uh, or at least some of them those who know what's really going on uh, by hundreds of thousands. Uh, and uh, so that's, um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is, you know, uh, brainwashing works, you know? I mean, period. Uh, uh, so so I, I am afraid that really a huge uh, you know, chunk of this uh, uh, intellectual society. They really believe that uh, uh, Ukraine is controlled by neo-Nazi uh, regime and uh, that they need to liberate Russians who are in Ukraine. Because, you know, uh, Putin is not talking about invading Ukraine for the sake of invading Ukraine. No, he is using exactly the same argument as Hitler used uh, when it uh, when it came to you know to uh, 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 Czechoslovakia, you know, liberating uh, uh, Germans, liberating Russians. That's exactly what Putin is saying. He is not saying this is a war. He's no, no, saying no. it's a special military no, operation. Not even allowed to use the term. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know the Orwellian you know speech. You know, uh, uh, so. So, um, well, I, 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 unfortunately, I do think that, that to some extent, uh, those people believe the, uh, the uh, propaganda. And, uh, and they keep arresting people left and right, you know. Uh, Vladimir Karamurza, who is uh, one, uh, I remember him when he was a colleague uh, at the Foreign Press Center in Washington, D.C. I, I, I remember him from you know, 15 years ago, now he is one of the uh, strongest voices of, of Russian opposition. Uh, and uh, uh, he has his residence in Northern Virginia, uh, where he lives with his wife, and I believe kids, but I, it doesn't matter. So anyways, he, uh, he went to Russia after the war started. Uh, and he knew that he was going to be arrested, and Putin did arrest him, and he's, and he's in jail. So Putin is arresting people left and right to silence any kind of opposition. Uh, so maybe there is this fear. Yeah. Could be that. And on a, a much lighter note, I would like to come back to the story about you being transferred from TV to CNN. I saw the story on the internet and I remember I smelled a rat. It was my gut reaction to the news bit because what I didn't like, I was suspicious of that bit um, saying, you know, this headline going, Marcin Vrona vanishes from TVN. It sounded so dramatic to me. <laughs> I already knew, well, <laughs> there must be something wrong with it. And my question is this, because you just published the photo and your comment was so short. Yeah. You didn't make any statement whatsoever. So wasn't it that you were trying to test what things worked like on the internet when you did that? Yes, yes, you're right. I, I, I kind of played with this. Uh, so so you are absolutely right, yes. But I never, and I, and I promise you that, I never suspected that people would understand this as, as me leaving for CNN and, you know, and all that. No, no. Uh, 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 you know, uh, TVN24, which is our news channel, is uh, has been called Polish CNN for many, many years, you know, so, uh, you know, I just kind of played with this, uh, and it was really innocent, and uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I broke my record, you know, 267,000, you know, people saw this, wow, but uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely amazing, and uh, yes, I did play with it. Yes. <laughs> so you see, that's what I thought. Is that I liked the joke so much because <laughs> I thought, wow, what a nice joke. <laughs>
Uh -huh. yeah. may, I, may I add something to, to your answer? Yes, sir. Actually? Not that I want to share the trillion dollar with you because you won <laughs> and already have answered the, the, the question so substantially. Uh, also an answer to, uh, to your question about the uh, real motivations of the, of the Russian intellectuals. Alicia just reminded me that, uh, what, about a month ago, uh, the rectors of the Russian universities mm -hmm. wrote a very long letter fully supporting what Putin is doing. Rectors of academia, okay? Academia, which is always the guardian of free speech, of debate at least, not free speech, right? No, fully supporting. Of course we know there are individuals who don't, yes? But the official word is that the universities do support them. Yet, propaganda uh, uses values as key words for brainwashing. Mm -hmm. We stand up for values, don't we? We all do. We did say today many things about values that we believe in. There are people that have other sorts of values, values which uh, we fail to support, they believe. And that's why they need leaders, great leaders like Putin, who stand up for their values. Not only in Russia, in Poland as well. I will mention a name because this is a name that's public now. Professor Anna Rajne, a former professor of my university who used to work in the Russian department of my faculty 15 years ago, so I didn't deal with her as dean then. Uh, then moved to the international studies department, a different faculty, uh, and working there, she put up Putin's, uh, Putin's portrait on the wall of her office, which was reported uh, because we had uh, trouble with Putin for some time, that's not she was saying. Uh, well, there was some investigation. I think she put, took it down. Now, within the last two months, she's published at least two or three articles in mostly right-wing press, primarily, <laughs> uh, supporting Putin. Not openly, but speaking about values, about values that the West has failed to protect, and that these values is what people like Putin represent. Mm -hmm. This has been her narration for some time already. It's not new. She knows the history of Russia very well, and she supports, not officially, unofficially, Putin. Now, uh, of course, other colleagues from my uh, faculty from the Russian department have criticized her openly. There is one friend of ours, Dragos, who uh, is now uh, taken to court by her because she believes that he has offended her. Dragos Trevinda, the former rector of Krosno State College, by the way, whom some of you may know. You remember Dragos, right? <laughs> So this, this is also uh, a Polish uh, kettle where things are somehow bubbling and burning, right? Bubble, bubble, boil and trouble. Uh, yes. Uh, Over to you, Martina. Uh, well, more it, questions. But, but what if it also happens here? Uh, uh, look, you know, the, 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 the uh, $40 billion package of, of aid for Ukraine was blocked by one of the senators. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Russian-controlled state media uh, uh, sometimes broadcast bits and pieces of certain TV shows from a certain TV network uh, because you know, the, 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 uh, the narrative seems to be supportive of Putin. So, so it, it, is, it is a problem. It is a problem. Uh, the problem is that the, the extreme left and extreme right seem to be kind of, you know, uh, someone once said that political views are a circle, you know, left, right, and then they meet over here. Uh, so, so some of the extreme views of left and right seem to be you know, uh, meeting at the same point when it comes to Putin and, and, and his whole situation with, with Russia. More questions? Uh -huh, Eva. Do you think that the Polish government is done with you? <laughs> With me personally. Uh, I <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, uh, President Duda, uh, uh, Polish president, uh, said that, that his veto closes 
this uh, this discussion at this chapter. And uh, and you know, uh, he's a fellow Krakowian, Jagiellonian University. Uh, <laughs> graduate and employee too. He, I mean, we suspended him for the presidential uh, term, but he can come back. He's a lawyer. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah. I, 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 I believe uh, this is the case. Yes. But don't you think? At the, sorry for that. But um, at the same time, I've already heard they stated that because of this merger or takeover, whatever we call it, of Warner Bros and discovery uh you're becoming a monopolist they said well we'll have to change anti-monopoly laws because that's simply impossible well uh, you know we are a uh, tv network which is uh, which is uh, uh, which still has the same structure in poland nothing to do with this. Okay. I, I will follow up on this if you allow me and and ask about about what you believe are Duda's motivations in the meter. Was he just trying to save Poland's face because the criticism was so strong? Or is he a supporter of free media? Huh. Well, uh, yeah, I, oh, yeah. Sure. I do not want to be uh, you know, uh, too political here because uh, this, is, this is not my place and not my job. But uh, he said it straightforward that uh, the ownership laws are sacred. And this is what he truly believes in. And, and I know. Good, good. That, that forebodes well for the future. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, okay. We've had a wonderful occasion to meet Martin Verona. Okay. Um, Marcin, I have something for you as a memo of this meeting, and uh, before I give it to you, I will open it because I need to show this to my friends, and uh, this is for Marcin Verona. <laughs> my last name is Crow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. It was my pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I hope this is not the last time that we're meeting in the context of ECU because we'll continue doing all sorts of projects uh, with students, some of them uh, working in communication and journalism. So I see no reason why we should not either. Well, they this. have only one story to tell, and they already heard. But it. the story is developing. The story is developing daily. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so our next final event is our um, barbecue um, food truck reception over at the Proctor Young House. We'll kind of lead the group over there. Um, it's Eastern North Carolina barbecue, which is as central of a, a food to our culture as you can get. But we'll tell you that there is Pork is used, barbecue is usually pork, but there is also turkey barbecue and there is chicken. Um, and a few quote unquote vegetables for the <laughs> vegetarians. How about the boiled peanuts? I, I, I don't know about that. I mean, so, I don't know that they're going to have, I love so them. Local. Yes, they are. I didn't, I didn't arrange for that. But there may be collards. I'm not sure. Of, um, but I hope you will all follow us over there in just a moment to that event. One more little thing. Uh, since last, uh, well, yesterday, the reception was sponsored by the Yagelum University. We had some gifts and, and uh, materials, promotional materials, which I hope you took home. Uh, well, today, uh, a contribution to the reception is made by Krosno. Krosno, yes, Joanna is there. You, you should, you should probably uh, <laughs> say a word. Uh, but uh, yes, we also prepared a little promotional gift from Krosno for all of you. Okay, we'll 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 distribute that so that you take it home. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, your great uh, performance. Uh, we've heard a lot of important. Uh, words important uh, for us. 
uh, as poles, so we uh, kind of uh, were um, had an opportunity to uh, listen uh, about uh, freedom of expression uh, from our compatriots which is really important um, to us. So thank you for thank that. You. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm grateful. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, Krosno State College, um, I would like to congratulate you on, uh, well, conducting, on facilitating this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, I'm sure we will meet in the future to discuss other important uh, things, important issues. Um, well, and without further ado, I think we should, yes, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much Actually, as you're leaving, I need to confirm that this is cross No, I said that. Okay, well, no. For those, for those who don't know, Krosno, uh, for the last hundred years, has been a center of glassmaking. It's really the Polish Burano. Uh, so the little piece you have there with the logo of that college is made by a local artist with whom we cooperate. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 